I am stretched upon your grave and will lie there forever if your hands were in mine I'd be sure they'd not sever Now what's really neat about this game is it is very asymmetrical. The Jihadist player starts with, or has three dice, and only three dice throughout the game. The reason for that is that the Jihad player is going to play an Ops card with a certain value when they want to perform one of their operations. The value of that Ops card from one to three equals the number of dice they will use for that particular operation. So by playing the uh, more valuable three ops cards, they're going to have a bigger chance of their operation succeeding because they're going to be rolling three dice. Conversely, the US player only has one die, but they don't use the ops values in the same way. In order to perform an operation in a country, they must play an ops card that is equal to or greater than the governance level in a particular country. So, for example, if the U.S. wants to perform an operation in, say, the Saudi Arabia here, they must play an ops card of a value of three, period. And they use their one die to complete that, that, act, that operation if a die is required. So, as the Jihad player adds more and more instability to the board, adding uh, more poor governance. It makes it a lot more expensive and difficult for the American player. So let's go over the U.S. events. The one I mentioned earlier is the major one, the War of Ideas, and that's how you improve the alignment or governance of a particular country. A U.S. player can only perform a War of Ideas in a country that is either a neutral or an ally and they play an ops card greater than or equal to the governance of that country. So let's take a look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an ally and it has a governance level of three. So the US player has to play a three ops card. Now when they play this three ops card, they're foregoing the event. So they're using the ops value and not the event. And since the US player is playing a US event, that event does not automatically trigger. So what they will then do is roll a die based on the War of Ideas table. Now if you remember there are several uh, charts and tables that are included with the game and they're going to look at the War of Ideas table here. You can see that. And that's going to tell them if they are successful or not. I'm not going to go through all the die roll modifiers right now, but they would simply roll a die and basically what you're trying to get is a modified die roll of uh, four, five, or six. If the modified die roll is four, you don't actually succeed, you fail, but you get to place an aid marker onto the country. And that gives you a plus one for your next War of Ideas roll. And you can only add one aid marker in this way, so you can't keep failing and adding more aid markers. So the next time, it would help you succeed. If you do succeed with a 5 or 6, then what you're going to do is move the governance marker towards ally, and once it hits ally, then you start improving it. So you're always going to move the uh, alignment up, and then you're going to improve governance. So if I succeeded in Saudi Arabia here, I'd move it towards ally. We already are ally, so then this would instead shift from poor to a fair ally now, and I would have to adjust the victory conditions track accordingly because now there's one fewer poor country and one additional fair country. The next operation that the US can take is disrupting. And disrupting is how the US player is going to remove cells from various uh, places on the board. And what you have to do, obviously, is play a card equal to or greater than the governance level of the country, and you can affect one cell. So, 
Let's take an example here. Let's say we had two cells here in Pakistan. So in order to disrupt that, the U.S. player would have to play an ops card of at least two. So let's say the U.S. player played this card, which is an unassociated event card, so it doesn't trigger automatically, and a value of two. And that's going to affect one of the cells. Now it will affect two cells, actually, if the posture of the country is hard, which isn't the case here because posture only occurs in the non-Muslim countries. The other way it can affect two cells is if there are two or more troops in that country. And so if there are two or more troops in Pakistan, you would affect two of the jihad cells. And you'd actually also gain a prestige bonus of plus one. So you would move up on the prestige track down there. So let's say for the sake of example, there are in fact two troops here. I would play my two ops card. I would move up one on the prestige track, which is out of frame right now. And I would affect two troop or two cells. And what that means is you would first flip cells to their from their sleeper side to their active side, and then you would remove them from the board. You cannot flip and remove a cell in the same turn. So if both of these were sleeper cells, by affecting two cells, you would flip both of these to their active side. If, say, one was sleeper and one was active, you would flip one to sleeper and you would remove the active, and that goes back to the jihad funding track. Or, obviously, if they were both active, you'd remove both of them to the jihad funding track. There, unfortunately for the, for the U.S. player, but fortunately for the jihad player, when troops are completely removed as a result of the disrupt operation, then you have to place a cadre marker. So let's say these cells were removed by the disrupt operation, a cadre marker is placed. A cadre marker allows the jihad player to recruit into that particular country. Under normal circumstances, they can only recruit to countries under Islamist rule or countries that already contain cells in it. So this would allow them to recruit there. Once uh, more cells are going to be added to this, that cadre marker is removed. So it's not there permanently. It's only there until more recruit operations happen there. Also, if there are no cells in a country where a disrupt is, happens, then that would allow you, the U.S. player, to remove that cadre marker. The next thing the U.S. player can do is alert. An alert is how you block plots that the jihadist player has placed on the board. In order to block a plot, you simply play a three operations card, and you look at the plot value, and you remove it, and you put it back in the available plots box. So there is no die roll necessary for that. Another action is called reassessment. That's where the U.S. player can change their their uh, alignment here on the or their posture rather on the global war on terror relations track. You must play two three ops cards, so that will consume your entire turn. And you flip your posture to the opposite box. And there, that is very expensive, but there could be some reasons that you would want to do that, especially if the world marker was, say, way over on soft and you're getting a really nasty War of Ideas penalty. You may have to do that to avoid getting that penalty. And now that I bring that up, I might as well tell you that one of the die roll modifiers I mentioned earlier is when these are on opposite sides, whatever this value is, is the negative modifier to your War of Ideas roll. So in this case, since they are on separate sides, and this is at a 3, it would be a negative 3 die roll modifier to the War of Ideas roll, which already needs a 5 or a 6 to fully succeed. If it was here, it would be a negative 1 to the di that die roll modifier. Or if it was here, that was 3 and this was soft, that would be a 3, negative 3 modifier. Because the modifier, the negative modifier happens when these two are opposite each other. So that might be a reason why the U.S. has to spend that really expensive action of reassessing. Next thing the U.S. can do is deploy troops on the map. Those troops deploy means you can deploy troops from the troops track 
or deploy them from any location on the board where troops exist. Basically what you must do is play an ops value equal to or greater than the governance of the country in which you want to deploy those troops and you move as many troops as desired from one location to the target location. The location that you move troops though has to be an ally. You can see that there are troops in Pakistan and Pakistan is not an ally but these uh, were placed here at the beginning of the game for the setup process. But say if I wanted to deploy troops now, they could not deploy here because they are um, not an ally. And you can, again, like I stated, you can deploy as many troops as you like all from one location. So I can move several troops from the troops track right on to the country that I wanted to deploy. Or I could move several from one country to the target country. They do not have to be adjacent. Next one is called a regime change. So that's how the U.S. player is going to change... Islamist rule countries um, or shift them from being Islamist rule and that's by changing that regime. The US must have a hard posture and it costs a three ops card and what you're going to do is deploy six troops all from one location which generally means from the troops track but if you have six troops in another uh, non-regime change country you would deploy those to the regime uh, the country in which the regime change is taking place so in this case Afghanistan you would activate all the cells there meaning flipping all the cells there to their active side the country immediately becomes an ally and you roll their governance level so let's do a quick example of this so let's say we're going to do Afghanistan we're going to do a regime change I'm going to deploy six troops from the troops track here, which again is expensive because that's going to bump our troops now from the low intensity box all the way to the war box. So that's fewer cards I'm going to draw in the beginning of my turn. All these cells are going to become active. And why does that matter? Well, now that they're active, it makes it easier to disrupt those troops. Because remember, I must make them active first before I can remove them. Now they're already active. So, and there are greater than... There are two or greater troops already here, so each ops card I use is going to remove two troops back to the troops track. So it's going to be easy for me to get those, those uh, cells out of that country now that it has uh, been regime change. So we're going to place a green regime change marker on it here. And we're going to roll for the governance level because it's no longer going to be Islamist rule. It's going to be an ally of some type. So I'm going to look on the player aid, and you can see here that if I roll a 1 through a 4, it's a poor governance. And if I roll a 5 to a 6, it becomes a fair governance. So I'll roll a die, I roll a 5, so then I put a fair governance marker as an ally on there. And I need to adjust my victory conditions track, of course, as well. Also, the final thing that you do after a regime change is you roll for prestige. So that means that your prestige down here is going to change. And the way you do that is you roll a die. And you look on the chart here. And at the bottom it says if you roll a 1 to a 4, and this is modified by that global war on terror relations penalty. So if there's a penalty here, it's going to modify that roll. But see here we're on the same side, so there's no negative modification. I rolled a 5. So I can see that that's going to cause my prestige to increase. If I roll a 1 to a 4, my prestige is going to decrease. So now that I've rolled a 5 and I know my prestige is going to increase, how much does it increase by? Well, I take two dice. The only time uh, that I can think of uh, in a normal operation where the U.S. will use more than one die, I roll the die and it will increase or decrease, depending on that first roll, by the lower amount. So in this case, it will increase by 3. 1, 2, 3. Also, now that Afghanistan is a regime change country and has that regime change marker on it, those troops are stuck there and they cannot be removed or redeployed from this location until this regime change marker is removed. And the way that is removed is for the governance to get to good. When it hits good, the regime change marker is removed. Or if it goes all the way back down to Islamist rule, the regime change marker is removed and those troops are free to, to move. Now, there is an exception to that rule, of course, and that is the next uh, U.S. action, our operation called Withdraw, and that allows you to withdraw troops from a regime change country. 
And what happens is you can only do that if your U.S. posture is soft and you must play a three ops card. And you can withdraw as many troops as you want. You remove any aid markers that have accumulated there. You must roll prestige again. And you must place a besieged regime marker there. So that is the benefit that the Jihad player gets. Uh, if you would withdraw, is you have to place this besieged regime. And that makes it easier for the Jihad player to shift a country back to Islamist rule. And I'll explain that when I talk about their actions. And the final action of the U.S. player is reserve. So that's adding to that reserve track. Still with me so far? All right, hang in there. I'm only going to go over the Jihadist actions next here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. So the Jihad player uh, has several actions as well, and the first of which is called the Jihad. And that's how they worsen the governance. So while the U.S. player is going to be using that war of ideas to increase governance, the Jihad player will be using the Jihad to worsen governance. You must play an Ops card equal to the number of dice that you want to roll. And for each die that you want to roll, there must be at least one cell in the country. So for the sake of example, let's say there are two cells here in the Gulf states. And the Jihad player wants to shift that. So they need to play uh, a value equal to the number of dice they want to roll. But let's say they want to roll, roll three dice. You'd say, oh, they play a three ops card. But there's only two cells here. And you must have at least one cell for each die. So instead, they're just going to play a two ops value card. So they'll play that card. They will roll two dice. And you will... And what they're looking for is a value equal to or less than the governance level. So in this case, they failed. When you fail, the Jihad player must remove a cell. If the Jihad player had instead, say, rolled a 2 and succeeded, they would shift this one toward the governance uh, one towards Islamist rule. So in this case, they would shift from fair to poor. And if the jihadist player will will never, by this way, shift towards adversary. They're only going to be shifting the governance. The way that they want to shift to adversary is by actually completing a major jihad. So let's give an example here of a major jihad. The jihad player must have at least five more cells than troops in a country in which they want to do a major jihad. So in this case, there's no troops, so they only need five cells in here. If there was one troop, they would need six cells. If there were two troops, they would need seven cells, and so on. Then what they must do is roll dice in the same way as a minor jihad, but instead, they need two successful die rolls in order to shift to Islamist rule. So once it is poor, they need two successful rolls. So what they'll do is they'll flip all the cells to their active side. And they will roll dice equal to the ops card that they played. So obviously... Since they have to roll at least two dies and get at least two successes, they have to play at least a two ops card. But they can play a three ops card to increase their chances by rolling three dice. They'll roll three dice, and if there are at least two successes, which there are in this case, and the success for the Jihad player being die rolls equal to or less than the governance level, then they immediately succeed, remove this poor marker, shift it to Islamist rule, and immediately becomes an adversary. If they failed, they would remove one cell for each failing die, which can be really nasty if they're if they are just the dice aren't rolling for them. And even worse, if you happen to fail with all three dice, meaning all three dice are failure dice, so that's not to mean that you roll three dice and you fail to the major jihad. It just means if you roll three dice and only since you need two successes and only one of the three is a success, then you are not considered failing with three dice. But if all three dice were, say, this, six, six, and four, so all those are greater than three, that is a fail of all three dice. When that happens, then you must remove, of course, the, the cells in, in the country. You also shift the box one towards ally. 
So this would shift here, and then the player uh, would place a besieged regime marker here. Now that's kind of a consolation prize because the besieged regime marker makes it that they only need a singular success of a major jihad to shift to Islamist rule. And let's just breeze through the last couple actions here. Uh, the jihad player can do a recruit, which is moving cells from the funding track onto any country that has a cadre marker or any existing cells. And you must play um, you must play a a ops value card um, equal to or less than uh, or I mean I'm sorry play an ops card equal to the number of troops that you want to move so or the troops number of troops that you want to recruit so obviously that cannot be more than three because that's the highest ops card value and you would roll a die and it must. Uh, a die per cell and it must be equal to or less than the governance of the country that you're moving them into. So if you wanted to recruit to the Gulf states here, it has a governance level of three. Let's say you're attempting to recruit three cells, you would roll the die and for each value of three or less you would recruit straight to the Gulf states. Uh, recruitment in regime change countries and recruitment to Islamist rule countries though is automatic so you won't have to roll any dice. Also, there are some countries that have a recruit value on them, and that recruit value is going to take precedence over the governance level. So an example of that here is the Philippines has a recruit value of 3, so you're always going to succeed on a value of 3 or less, regardless of the uh, posture or governance level of that country. Which brings me to the other point that you can also recruit in the non-Muslim countries. All the non-Muslim countries have a hard-coded, so to speak, um, governance level of, in this case, India is a 1. Philippines, as I showed you, had a, had a fair 2. The next thing that the Jihad player can do is travel. Um, you have to play an ops card, depending on how many you want to travel, so 1, 2, or 3. And traveling to an adjacent country is automatic. If you are, you can also travel within the same country. That means you can, if I wanted, that, that, that's essentially the way for the jihad player to flip their active cells back to inactive or sleeper cells. So by, because every time they travel, whether it's within the same country or to another country, they flip to their sleeper side. So if you want cells to stay in the same country, but you want to flip over to their sleeper side, so it's harder for the U.S. to disrupt and remove them, then you would travel within the country. And like I said, travel to adjacent countries is automatic. And if you want to travel to a non-adjacent country, you must roll a dice equal to your ops value, which indicates how many you're trying to move, and you are rolling less than or equal to governance, of course. Then we also have the reserves, which is the same for the jihadist player as it is for the US player. You can spend an ops card to add to your reserves. And the final operation that the jihads can uh, play is plot. So that is placing those plot markers. You have to play an ops card uh, equal to how many cells you're going to, or I'm sorry, how many plots you'd like to attempt to place. So with a three ops card you would roll three dice and attempt to place three plots. Um, and of course you must roll less than or equal to the governance value of the country. And it cannot be an Islamist rule country because why would they want to put plots in countries they already control? So for example if they wanted to place uh, plots in the Gulf states you must have at least one cell in there per die you want to roll. You flip the cells that are going to attempt to place plots to their active side and you'll roll three dice and in this case for every three or less it's a success. In this case there are two successes, so they would the jihadist player would secretly select two of these, and they would select whichever ones they want. So generally, they will pick the higher value one. So there's a three, so they might put the three one in there, and put also like the two one in there. And then it would be up to the U.S. player to disrupt those. If they are not disrupted at the end of the turn, then there are all sorts of bad things that happen to the American player, but if they are successful, it's a way to increase funding, to decrease the prestige of the U.S. player, remove aid markers, change the posture of countries, and all sorts of other nasty things. So you'll notice at game start, 
most of the countries do not have any sort of markers on them. And basically, none of the non-Islamist rule countries have, have their posture marked with the hard or the soft uh, token here. And that's because it is not until you actually perform an operation that affects a particular country that those are marked. So if the jihadist player, for example, wanted to move cells from Afghanistan to Central Asia, before they do anything, they, you always roll for the posture. And uh, you always roll, I'm sorry, for the governance in the case of the Islamist countries or posture in the case of the non-Islamist countries. And we kind of touched on that before. You're going to take your handy dandy cheat sheet here and you're going to roll governance there on the right hand side. A 1, 2, a 4 is poor, a 5 or 6 is fair. And when you're doing this initial test of a country, they always start as neutral. So the Jihadist player wanted to go, uh, move from Afghanistan to Central Asia. It's an automatic move if they wanted to since they uh, are adjacent. So let's say the a Jihad player played this uh, two ops card. So they want to move two of these guys to here. So they would flip over to their sleeper side because that happens whenever the cells travel. And you immediately have to test this country. It tests it at a four. Four equals poor. So this starts as a poor neutral. And then the jihadist player could then attempt to move this to adversary and Islamist rule and all the other nasty things that they try to do. And of course, as soon as you test a country, that's going to affect the victory um, track down here. The same type of thing happens for all the uh, non-Islamist countries, except for when you move into one of these or perform an, any sort of operation that affects one of these then you would roll on the posture table, which is the one right below it there, and you roll a 1 to a 4, it's a soft posture, and a 5 to a 6 is a hard. And whenever you do that, you always have to remember to adjust the GWAT relations track. So right now it's World Hard 1. Let's say I was performing an operation uh, in Spain here, and I rolled a die and they ended up being soft. So this moves down one. And then let's say another operation was performed in France, and that was soft, so that would move down one. And now we have a, a GWAT um, penalty here since the world is now soft, the U.S. is hard, they, the U.S. is now going to have a negative one die roll modifier for all its War of Ideas rolls, and that's really nasty. So that's basically the core rules of the game. Um, and so now let's just take a look at a couple of the different types of cards, and then I'll sum it up. So here's a U.S. card with a two ops value. So again, you can either use it as its two ops value or have it trigger the event, which in this case says remove a cell from a Muslim country, not Iran. You may have noticed uh, that Iran on the board is a little bit different, um, and it's kind of a special case during the game. So that's why a lot of these cards uh, do not affect Iran. Here's a jihadist player card called Loose Nukes, and it says play if Russia has a cell and no CTR marker. There's a particular event that places that CTR marker. So if that's uh, if you satisfy that criteria, then roll as if a one operation there. So a jihad player would roll one die, and remember their operations always have to be less than or equal to the governance level there to be successful. So you'd roll just like any other one operation, and if it's success, you had a WMD to the available plots. And if it's a failure, you remove the cell. And this card you can see has the remove uh, word down here, which means this is a one-time use card. If it's used at the, as, for its ops value, then it goes into the discard pile and is reshuffled. But if you use it for the event, the event causes it to be removed from the game permanently. Here's another one, Lebanon War says U.S. discards a random card, minus one prestige, and place a cell in a Shia mixed country. And that's the country with that symbol. So that's a, that's a pretty good card, but it's also a three ops. So you have to decide, do you want to sacrifice the three ops for this event, or sacrifice this pretty good event to use the three ops? Here's an, another one. Sarkawi. Play, and this is an unassociated event. It says play if either Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, or Jordan has troops. If U.S. play, plus three prestige and remove this card. If it's a jihadist play, place three cells and a plot two there. So that's a plot card with a two value. Covert action. 
play if you can select an adversary country. So that's a country that has adversary um, on its alignment. And on a roll of four to six, shift it to neutral. And uh, let's see if I can find another good one here. There are, uh, here we go, Gitmo. And you can see this is a lapsing one, meaning there is a, uh, this is a, an event that lapses for the remainder of the turn. In this case, no recruit operations or detainee release the rest of this turn. So that would go in the lapsing event box as a reminder. And there's some other uh, cards that say mark and remove. Here we go. Here's one. So you can see this one says, play for a regime change country has a cell. Minus one prestige, block UN nation building. Mark and remove. So you'd find the card associated, or I'm sorry, the token down here that's associated with that event. And you would mark it on the board. And you will know that that prevents the UN nation building. And what's pretty nifty about these tokens is that, oops, is that they're double-sided. This one says leak. So this is the token that is used if the Jihadist player plays the leak uh, card and leak event. And in the brackets it says enhanced measures because the leak card prevents the enhanced measures card event of the US player from being played. So it will say that obviously on the card, but the token here, uh, the chit will remind you that as well. And on the other side, you can see that says enhanced measures. So uh, mostly they're double-sided that have the, the events that uh, have to do with each other on each side. So what do I think about Labyrinth, The War on Terror? Well, I have to say, I love this game. It's actually my current favorite game, and it was actually one of the first war games that I got into. There's just so many options, so many cards, so many paths to victory, so many different ways to win, and the two sides play totally asymmetrically. So you can have some great strategies and have some great luck with, say, the U.S. player. And then you switch to the Jihad, you have no idea what you're doing. It's crazy because it's totally different. Their strategies are just totally different because of the different ways that the operations are successful. The Jihad lies very heavily on die rolls and die rolls that have to do with the governance level of the countries. Whereas the American player has uh, not as much on die rolls, and they just have that mostly that's, that uh, war of ideas modifiers that they have to worry about. Um, so I just love the mechanics of the game. I love how it's asymmetrical. Um, there's a lot of meat to it. Um, and I really enjoy that about it. The component quality, I feel like I say this with every game I review, but the component quality on this is is excellent. GMT is definitely my favorite um, game company. Uh, actually, when I received this game, there was some damage to the board. I just let them know, and they immediately just shipped me out a, a new board. Um, they didn't have to do that. I, I, uh, I really appreciate that, and they've always had excellent customer service, and they do a lot of great work with the community and veterans. And uh, they were actually semi-local to L.A., where I uh, used to live. They're in the California area. And so I really like GMT as a company, so not to get too sidetracked. But these bits are great. All the tokens are, are very thick, um, very thick cardboard. You have those really nice pre-painted uh, troops cubes. These octagonal black Jihad cell cubes with the with that shiny, glossy other side that I'm sure you can't see from there, but it, how neat is that? It is awesome. It's so cool. The cards, let me grab some here, are uh, the typical, um, you know, modern GMT game, extra thick card stock. They're excellent. I put them in sleeves anyway because I love this game and I want it to last forever. Um, the player aids are very well done, and like I said, there's a couple on the Geek um, that are great to download that um, are a big help as well. In my opinion, the rule book is extremely well done. It's very, very clear, just like all of GMT's uh, rule books. It's, um, it's kind of written like a dictionary, but it's very clear. It's very easy to reference, especially in the back, that glossary, which I actually read from earlier, if you recall. Uh, is awesome because you think, what is uh, prestige again? Oh, and here it is. You, you know, you read about what prestige is, and it tells you exactly where in the rule book 
um, that section is. So you glance right back to it, and boom, there it is. You have several different scenarios on the back here, so you're not just always playing the same thing. And it has solitaire, excellent solitaire, brutal solitaire. And there's ways to ramp up the solitaire difficulty, so you don't get in a rut. I mean, there are several different ways, um, different rules you can tweak that are in the rule book for how to make the solitaire AI more difficult, and it certainly does. I've played solitaire several times, and it's a lot of fun when you can't uh, find another person to play the game with. So overall, I hope you uh, stay with me during that ridiculously long rules overview. Um, I basically just touched on the major components, but you combine all those different mechanics together with all the different cards and events. Sure, there's a there's a little bit of randomness uh, in the die rolls, and you know that can get frustrating sometimes, especially for the jihad player. But the game mitigates that pretty well with a lot of its rules because if you uh, and and it's up to you whether to you know be dumping those three ops, um, those three ops event cards uh, to use for die rolls because a lot of times, or most of the time, those three ops cards have very good events. So you could use those ones for events instead of, um, in order to mitigate the risk of rolling three dice. So lots of different uh, options. There's a lot of flexibility to the gameplay. There's flexibility to the length of the game because you can play one, two, or three decks worth. You can play it solo, you can play with two players. This game has everything any war gamer um, could want, in my opinion. Um, and it has a lot of Euro-y elements to it. Um, because it's not just your typical chip-pushing war game on a giant hex map. So, I really think if this at all interests you, you should definitely check it out. Um, it is... Uh, in, I know the game, maybe there was some controversy surrounding it because of the subject matter. But, um, in my opinion, it's very tastefully done. There's definitely no, uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of prejudice against either side, the U.S. or the Jihadist side. Um, it's a lot of historical text and background in the rule book and in the playbook. And, um, so very tastefully done. So I wouldn't worry too much about that as well. So, Labyrinth, The War on Terror. Fabulous game, my favorite game. Anybody who want to play online on War Game Room, shoot me a geek mail. I'm always looking for new players to play with. So this is an awesome game. Check it out, definitely.